So it's a, a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Angela Slit. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's great to be here. And I, I really feel like this is actually um, a story. Right now, this is coming full circle because had I not been in Kurt Claussen's lab and spent time um, a really, really exceedingly awesome uh, postdoctoral experience with Kurt um, using this technology, we would have never, I wouldn't be talking about it today. So in some ways, this is really full circle to something that started a, a while ago. So today I'm going to talk to you about how we developed a SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid test and really kind of share the journey of an academician trying to do really a, a regulatory exercise that really requires a lot of work and, and has its own expertise. And I think people kind of feel like, academicians always feel like they can do everything, but the reality is that, that um, these types of assays do require an incredible amount of expertise. And it was a really humbling, uh, exciting, and kind of wild experience. And so I, I thought uh, Jeff asked me to share it with you. And, and so here I am. So normally our laboratory, as Jeff mentioned, studies um, NIH and USDA related topics. So we have an interest in environmental links to liver disease and obesity. We also collaborate with medicinal chemists who hand us kind of molecules related to natural products. Um, lately it's been CBD and understand how those products can affect inflammation, NAFLD. So we're an NIH and USDA funded research program. And largely, um, a lot like Dr. Stottinger and Dr. Clausen, we spend a lot of time quantifying RNA from tissues and cells. That's routine in, in our laboratory. And, and it's really that kind of um, expertise that makes us all think that you know, at one point or another, we can detect SARS-CoV-2 and, and work. And in reality, we can, you know, it's, it's um, we have a tool set and it's how you choose to apply that tool set. So we actually have used Quantigene technology quite a bit. And this is the technology that we used to develop the SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid test. And this was a technology from a long time ago. And it started, at least for me, when I was back as a postdoc in Kurt Claussen's lab. So me personally, I have about 45 papers using Quantigene technology. I'm sure Dr. Clausen probably has 400. Um, it was a staple in the laboratory because it was so quick and easy to use. Currently, we use it a lot because it um, is a, an in-between type of method between PCR and RNA sequencing. So when our group is interested in surveying about 50 to about 50 genes per se, we may go that route compared to doing a full on sequencing experiment because of cost and time. And, and sometimes actually just the analysis that goes into all of that sequencing data afterwards is more work than just getting targeted information that we need. Um, so this technology can be used either as a multiplex or it can be used as a single plex. And I'll talk to you about today, it's use as a single plex because it's a more sensitive, it's about tenfold more sensitive platform. But I will say that this, the QGP has also been used in um, infected SARS-CoV-2 cells. And a group in Italy recently used that multiplexing technology to study SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and in our hands, it allows us for really a kind of a very quick inter interrogation for um, this targeted gene analysis. And recently, we have a paper in 2020 where we did this analysis against um, targeted proteomics and saw a really nice concordance between the mRNA and the protein expression. So here's just an example of some of the data that we had from livers of mice treated with a toxicant called um, PFAS. But really, I think what, what this is illustrating is here's the mRNA expression that we got from the assay in this platform. And this is protein expression by proteomics using um, data in, independent acquisition, swath mass spectrometry. And so visually, you can just see right away that there's really a high concordance between them. And we're kind of continuing on that path to just kind of analyze the platform for this purpose. So this is kind of what had been going on in the background and, and in part was what triggered us to want to study it in, this, in the context of SARS-CoV-2. 
So really, right before um, SARS-CoV-2 hit, this was a staple in our laboratory for screening. And we would be using it for human hepatocytes. They might have been treated with drugs or PFAS. Um, we put them together with potentially first a, a metabolism assay or an uptake assay and kind of look at function. And then what we can do is then, and then take those cells um, and lyse them and get the RNA from them and then look at the measurement for about 40 transcripts. And so we have a paper that's currently um, under consideration for environmental science and technology, where we've interrogated, um, used this to interrogate numerous emerging PFAS. So that was kind of how we were using the technology in the lab currently. And you can see over here, this is an output of kind of the heat map that we are getting from surveying a large number of emerging chemicals in human hepatocytes. And so we really kind of wanted to know was, could we use this technology to detect SARS-CoV-2? And I want, you know, it's been about a year. So I wanted, I kind of wanted to mentally go back to where we were a year ago um, and just kind of point out some things here. So we remember that January really like we didn't, it was in China. And then February, you know, it's coming to America. And probably for us, really what was a pivotal moment, at least in the, road, the world of Rhode Island and, and Connecticut, was that in March, two people tested positive from St. Raphael Academy. And Rhode Island is this incredibly small state. So if you find it on the map, it's like a blip. And it's a really integrated state. So that means that, you know, kids sporting events, you name it, like everybody's there. I, I, you know, that particular weekend, we were at a sporting event where almost all of Rhode Island, if you were a track, an indoor track runner for high school, boys, girls, parents were all in one spot. And so it really kind of hit us very hard and very quickly that there, this could be an issue. And, and really right around that time, I reached out to Thermo Fisher and started working with them. And I just wanna bring up, so this was, this was a vice principal for St. Raphael's. They'd went on a trip to Italy. He had commented that he had used hand sanitizer all the time, that he knew that there was a virus. He was very careful. And he tested positive on March 2nd. By March 10th, the Providence Journal was running a story about him. And at this point, he's recounting how he was moments from death. He's in his 40s. He was in the ICU. He felt like he was being strangled. And the staff was draining his lungs every two hours. And he survived. But Rhode Island being kind of a really small community, realistically, word traveled really fast that this was a very, very serious virus. And so um, on our end, because of that, and because we had the ability to start working with our Department of Health, we decided that we would try to see if we could apply this technology to detect SARS-CoV-2 and, and work with the Department of Health to get um, our hands on some samples. And so we formed a, a team and that team was me. And then it was also Thermo Fisher. So because our product was a research only assay, we were working with Thermo Fisher to go and create a better, to create a probe set. Could this technology be used? We knew it had been used in the clinical development of remdesivir. And so we felt that if we came together, we could work, um, make this work. So we had a team of me and then my research group. So um, a current now postdoc, Emily Marks, um, she's at UMass, and then uh, another graduate student, Juliana Agudello, and two URI undergraduates. And, and we worked kind of almost night and day on this problem once um, mid-March hit. So I just want to tell you a little bit, remind you about some of the things to consider for the SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. And a lot of the times what we were thinking about was how much material is on whatever you get. And, and not like that, but what is the, the, how can we remove rate limiting steps along the way? And so now you've kind of heard all of this, but remember in March, we, there were so many unknowns. And so these are things we do know, you know, for nasal, throat and spear, um, sputum, the, the copy number is pretty high. And so this means on a nasal swab, you know, you can get from a, a million to a trillion copies per swab. That's actually a fairly large amount oh. to measure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and, but what we didn't know at the time, but then, you know, data emerges, more information comes out, is that, you know, where did saliva fit? Because we knew we had an assay that could work very well for saliva and not have to do any extractions. Okay. And so thankfully, um, data came out to support that saliva has fa a fairly equivalent copy number compared to a nasal swab. 
I just want to point out some other things to kind of keep in the back of your head. Um, typically for a PCR assay for SARS-CoV-2, the cutoff is somewhere between a 35 to a 38, a CT value that's like an amplification, uh, a number related to amplification. And that, that is estimated about a one to two copies per assay well. Now, um, a CT28 to 30 or lower is really what's considered to be infective. So when you know studies have went back and said what CT value really corresponds to that sample being able to either infect cells in vivo, in vitro, excuse me, or have some correlation to human infectivity. And that's more of like a CT of a 25 to a CT 30. Some people actually say it's more like a CT 25. And those are more of a, 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 about 1,000 to 5,000 copies per reaction. So that's a much, much higher kind of tighter per, per, per mil than compared to um, what could be detected really when you're looking at a PCR where it can really detect maybe just one or two copies um, in a reaction. So what makes a good diagnostic assay? I didn't know this. I was an academic. I thought I could do just about anything. And you just put in your reference standard, you see it, and that's it. And there's really a lot to think about. And the regulatory guidance kind of makes you go through that. So a good assay has to be sent. We've heard all of this now through the news, but sensitive, specific. We have to think about the supply chain. And so that was a really big um, selling point for our assay was that it wasn't working off of a PCR based platform. And so when the Department of Health in Rhode Island was getting hit very hard and didn't have enough reagents to extract RNA, then all of a sudden the discussions around kind of trying to get a different assay uh, up and running was really important. Obviously the faster the turnaround, the better, cheap, the sampling should be as least invasive as possible. And here I have a picture of either what looks like a nasal swab or a nasal pharyngeal swab. And I can tell you that the talk on the school bus all the time is about, is about whether or not it's going to poke your brain or not. And we have to say, no, that's not going to happen. I talked to my kids about it, but the ability to, to collect non-invasively like saliva is a, a really good tool to have when you think about surveying lots of different populations. It needs to be accessible. So I think in the United States, we live in the land of plenty. We're used to having fine equipment, but there has to be assays. Um, again, thinking about March and April here, you know, what was going to happen in countries like Africa or in not countries, but continents like Africa, um, countries like India, where there may not be access to really high-end thermocyclers. And lastly, obviously um, high throughput. And there's a balance between something that is you know, one test after another after another versus one that can run many over hours. So those are a lot of the different components that one thinks about when they're um, creating a clinical assay. And so in the news, you've heard a lot about sensitivity and PCR. And I will tell you that upfront that one of the challenges that we had was that our Rhode Island, Rhode Island Department of Health really didn't want to hear anything about any other assay than PCR. They felt like that at the time, their knowledge and their mindset, and it's not a bad mindset, we just didn't know, was that it, ha it had to be as sensitive P as PCR or it was not worth investing in. Um, and we now know that there's some implications to that in the sense that PCR can be really useful, but if it takes you 12 days to get your result back, which it was, um, then the person, you've missed a window of time to quarantine someone. Um, the also, the also the possibility is that what can happen is individuals can shed the virus for a long period of time. And then you have implications of someone showing up positive, even though they're not infectious. And quarantine does have implications. It has implications for people with jobs, children in school. So there's a lot of, so again, like we can think about PCR and PCR is the gold standard, but the question is really, is there room for other things? So lack of sensitivity. Obviously, if we have a test that's not sensitive enough, um, you can miss a positive. And depending on where that individual is in the trajectory of their infection, you could potentially miss that infectivity unless you're testing often. So there's different mantras, different mindsets kind of really, I'm sure most of you being scientists kind of watch those evolve over the, fall, the springtime and into the summer about does it have to be highly sensitive or is it about testing as often as you can with something that may be cheaper and less sensitive and available. Um, so there's lots of advantages and disadvantages to each. 
and I kind of put this, you know, figure on the left hand side because like we have a Ford Focus and we have a Lamborghini. And of course everybody would like the Lamborghini, but sometimes we can use a Ford Focus to get, I hope none of you own Ford Focuses, um, but it's teasing here, but like, you know, that a Ford Focus can also get you where you need to go. And so I think that there's value in both. And this was a debate that we had for months. This debate came up all the time. And as new papers came out, the debate would shift and change. And it's like, you think you, you thought that you were done and then you weren't. And so really my feeling was all of the approved tasks have sort of served a purpose in the pandemic. They all have their benefits. You know, I thought my husband, I remember the day that the Cepheid was, uh, they announced it, 45 minute test. And he's like, Ange, you're done. And I think someone else texted me and I was like, oh God, great. But then the reality is that the Cepheid, it's only 45 minutes, whoops. But it can only hold 160 cartridges at a time. So there, that's a rate limiting issue. The Abbott ID now has been tremendous. It's actually a very helpful tool. It's fairly insensitive. And realistically, when we use it at the mobile health unit that, uh, that we've partnered with in Pawtucket, they can only see about, they can only do about 200 tests to, you know, a, a day. So it's very useful. Now, when they find those people and they can quarantine them, that's great. But the reality is that's pretty low throughput. So there's thermotac path, great. But you know what? If you don't have the liquid handler tips to run this on this very automated system, you're stuck. Um, Abbott Binax now, very great school nurses, um, at least in Rhode Island, are using it to survey high school athletes, but it's at 40,000 copies per mil. But they all serve a purpose. And I would, I would, you know, and all of them have contributed to trying to help us control the pandemic. So what were the goals for our project? We um, decided that we'd use this quantity, excuse me, quantity and technology that I'll talk to you about in a minute to detect SARS-CoV-2 in saliva because this assay would allow us to not extract. It was easy, inexpensive, and accessible, meaning that you could get yourself set up in your lab um, with pretty much all the equipment you needed for less than $100,000 before you considered reagents or personnel. But the investment in it was pretty minimal. Um, we saw this, and we still do, as a way to augment PCR testing. PC we need PCR testing, but that doesn't mean that other tests can't be helpful either. And remember, we were thinking about this in March, 2020. So there were so many unknowns. So let me just take you through quickly what the single plex assay looks like. This would be an assay well. And the well is actually coated with oligonucleotides on the bottom. And this works off of kind of what we'd call cooperative hybridization. So what happens is um, basically in your first step, you add, um, what we would call some a probe set, and that probe set either binds to the assay plate. So these are DNA; these are pieces of DNA that have been synthetically um, made, and they can bind to either oligonucleotides on the plate or an, a piece of RNA. So in this case, this squiggly line is our piece of RNA for SARS-CoV-2. And then there are other parts of the probe set that also bind to the RNA, but are used for the subsequent steps. And so this kind of, if you will, captures the RNA and keeps it at the bottom of the plate. It's a lot like an ELISA for nucleic acids. And then subsequently there are label probes and amplification probes and a final step that results in luminescence. So you add a substrate, you can read it. It's not the sexy Lamborghini of PCR, but it can get you where you need to go. And really our thinking at the time was to create an assay that was accessible and could be used anywhere. A another advantage is that this assay, can, you can put in any input. So like I mentioned, we used it with hepatocyte lysate. So we could take a cell lysate and do nothing and put it into the assay and it would work. And so that was a tremendous asset when you're thinking about being limited in your supply in the sense that we weren't having enough nasal swabs period. And then we weren't having enough reagents to extract the RNA from nasal swabs either. So to be able to circumvent those two steps and use saliva or take a nasal swab, but put it directly into the assay, we felt was like, not directly, but, but essentially get the material off of it and put that into the assay. We felt that that was a tremendous benefit. And we had good reason to think that this would be highly concordant. This is an old study, but it shows very nicely that when you compare TAC path to this particular assay, there's actually a really high concordance. 
between um, the, two, the two platforms. So this was the probe set that we set out to design with Thermo Fisher. Um, you know, just honestly, the basic questions that we find easy as scientists were not so easy back in, in March. Um, you know, we had to find the sequences, understand what part of the sequence of the virus we want to go after. Um, will this work? And so we created a probe set with Thermo Fisher. Um, and thankfully, the first one that we tried worked pretty well. We did try some alternatives, and they were not as successful. So the assay itself is very simple. It's really kind of broken up into two days. We were able to condense it into one day and shorten all the times and keep the sensitivity. So really on day one, there's some pipetting and some incubating and you honestly inc incubate it in a relatively inexpensive lab oven, but as long as the air the airflow is good. And then the second day is more pipetting. There's some plate washing, just like in ELISA and then detection of luminescence. And the assay reads out in um, kind of a relative light unit. So it's a very simple assay, very trainable, very easy to train undergraduates. So we had a lot of different um, issues getting started. There were lots and lots of hurdles. I, I just, I guess spent a whole time just talking about hurdles, but probably one of the biggest ones was the reference material. It was hard to get, it was in short supply. And then the questions, even when you got it, how good it was. There were lots of unknowns. We didn't know how to handle it. We didn't know what levels of protection were needed and not only that, but our institutions may have a different viewpoint of how that should be uh, handled compared to ATCC or the CDC. So there are just a lot of unknowns at any point, you know, you crack something open and you've just felt so like what's going to happen next. And it was also really impossible at that time to get clinical samples. There were a lot of regulatory steps. So for me, I was the first person in the state of Rhode Island, the first researcher to get clinical samples from the Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, it took a lot. We had to go through a lot of regulatory steps, a lot of paperwork. I had to beg them. I had to bug them. Um, and finally, we got the standards, and that was really a breakthrough for us. So this, was our this is a typical path for assay development, and I put things I wish I knew that I, I now know. <laughs> um, so you're, you, you test your known reference standards, right? So everybody would do this. You take your known, you see if your assay works. And that's important, but you're only as good as your standard and not all of your standards are the same. So realistically, you can get two standards from the same company. They could be catalog number one, catalog number two, and then they give you different results. So that's something you have to consider along the way. You have to lock down your method. So once you've done this, you lock down your method. That's a really hard thing for academics to do. We are always tweaking everything and it could take a long time to lock down your method. And then we let, what we would do is we would wanna nail down and hone in on our limit of detection. And again, this is, you, this is done using the reference standard, and in our case, done using a reference standard spiked into deactivated saliva. And really what this is, is um, you know, this number, depending on how, there are many algorithms to come up with this number. So there can be a lot of debate just around a limit of detection and how to calculate it. Next, you would run clinical specimens unblinded to get a feel how they're going to perform in the assay. And then you start running lots and lots of plates all around your limit of detection over many days, over many runs, same many, lots of runs same day to understand the variability in your assay and how often you can detect what you think is your theoretical, or not your theoretical, but your limit of detection. And then you test the stability of your samples, your reagents, um, how long can something sit while being you before it's used up. And then very lastly, and really this is kind of where we're finally at, is to run a large number of blinded samples and understand how they perform. So this was like our very first piece of data. And um, this was with a BEI reference material that was genomic RNA from a coronavirus. And we were actually pretty excited because it showed a really good level of um, linearity and a reasonable level of sensitivity. And I put this disappearing here because this was the, whoops, sorry. This was like the disappearing standard. So it turned out that we then used this standard over a few times, over and over again, even though I was extremely careful handling it, and it was degrading. And every time we ran the assay, things got worse and worse and worse. And I later found out from the Department of Health that, they, that people across Rhode Island who had been using this had all run into the same situation, that if your standard's not good, you're kind of stuck. And so we struggled with that for a few weeks or so. And then the Department of Health finally was able to get permission to share our samples. And that was, I think in our minds, a game changer. So we were able to get isolated RNA from human uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs. 
These were individuals that had tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. And these samples would, would be, they were validated using an FDA approved FDR test, uh, excuse me, PCR test. So the great thing was that we had this data knowing upfront whether, you know, basically how much virus was there. Uh, the bad, the downside was that these samples had been handled before. So sometimes when we didn't, when we had discordant data, we weren't always sure if it was the assay or the sample integrity itself. So here's an example of the, just kind of our first test run with human samples. And um, so this again was showing, we ran some samples that either had low, um, C, either like a, like a low copy number or a higher copy number, our reference standard. And then these are the outputs that our assay gave. And so this is, for example, the assay RLU, and this is the copies versus you know, the number of copies. And again, seeing a very nice um, linearity for the assay compared to the copy number. And so this was a start. We didn't want to burn through. We had gotten 10 samples. We didn't want to burn through those. So we got through those and those looked pretty good. And then over time, the road to the Department of Health shared more samples with us. And so this is just an example of kind of like what some of the assay output looked like um, off of one of our older machines. And these were, these, for example, were real clinical samples. I, I've kind of taken away other parts of the plate to make this a little bit more um, easy to see. But the red here is showing you the signal that our output was getting that's, that meant very high numbers. So these had high RLUs. This meant that there was a lot of SARS-CoV-2 copy in that well. And how did that correspond to a CT value? So for those of you who don't know much about PCR, the lower the CT value, it means the more copies are there. The higher the CT value, it means fewer copies are in that reaction. And so we actually did see a, a pretty nice concordance between um, the copy number and that, this, excuse me, the CT value and our RLUs. And so we were able to see um, up to CT31. And so this is some data that, that we generated with a large number of um, human samples showing a really high concordance between the, the CT value that was given to us by RIDO on, their, on the FDA PCR assay versus our RLUs. So we felt really, really confident about this. Um, and at that point, we didn't know for sure, but we felt that we were probably at about 10,000 copies per mil for purified RNA. And we'll come back to that um, a little bit later. This wasn't horrible. At the time, some people would think it was horrible and that was a roadblock. Um, now we know that other, other people have found that 10,000 copies per mil is acceptable because we know that, that 10 to the fourth may not even really be an infectious um, kind of viral, viral load, if you will. So, but at the time, everybody was comparing this to PCR and that was the basis. So those were some of the hurdles that we had to overcome, but we were feeling pretty good about it. So what was the path forward at that point? We had IP issues to get through. Um, we knew that we could work with Thermo to position and create a product that we could be distributed like worldwide. Literally, they can take our assay at this point once we get the FDA EUA and put a different catalog number on it and sell it uh, under that catalog number instead. Um, and they have a lot of tools to give us. So soon when we're ready, we can leverage those tools. But there's some complicated IP around this assay too that's made it a little challenging. We felt that we could save money for the university. They're currently paying $30 a test. So back this uh, in the summertime, the president of the university said to me, I want you to create a less non-invasive test for our students. Can you do that? And you need to get it done by the fall. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, will I? And then along the way, um, in all of this, there was a lot of resistance, believe it or not, from the people who commercialize efforts at the university. So I often heard universities don't do testing and universities don't sell things. And those individuals had to have their minds kind of changed along the way. And in comparison, um, you know, other universities in the Northeast have literally spent millions, 40, 50, 60 million dollars on testing. So we were challenged, but, but you know, we, we kind of made it work. So April, we spent detecting SARS-CoV-2. April through September, I literally tried to find the right expert who could help us with the regulatory documents. They're there, but there's a lot of underlying data that you don't know what it is, what you're supposed to kind of provide. May through June, we, things went horribly. Uh, it turned out that a very cranky person that I had borrowed a, a, a lab oven from in our core facility took it back. And that lab oven had very good air circulation and we started using a different one. 
And that oven set us back about a month. We had no idea. We, we thought, could it really be the oven? And it was the last thing we tested. And that's always kind of how science goes. So we, we had some hurdles. There's sometimes it's hard to get equipment. And then July, we became back on track and things were going really great. We, we were able to get close to an LOD. We were using this, the reference materials and feeling pretty confident. And then in August, um, we, we formed a potential partnership with a CLIA sponsor. And so for those of you who have followed um, the kind of any of the testing, you have to have a CLIA sponsor to get the FDA EUA. And so this brought us to Dominion Diagnostics in North Kingstown, Rhode Island. And they're a mass spectrometry based drug testing lab. Um, we had, they came to our lab, we showed them how to use the, the do that they ran the assay with us. We had a very dis clear discussion with them about limit of detection. We then moved all of our equipment and reagents and everything you name it to their site and started working there. I was like an employee at Dominion for a few weeks for probably about a month. And then a poorly constructed experiment set us back. Um, and I don't, I could spend the whole, a lot of time talking about it, but basically the learning point from this is that, you, you know, if you go into these things, you've got to be super careful about how you design every single experiment, because if your partner doesn't really believe that what you have is good enough, they might want to just call it quits. And I have to say this company at the same time had gotten a huge grant from the state of Rhode Island to get PCR testing up and running, and they were stretched very thin. And when, when their analysis and my analysis differed by quite a bit, they were less enthusiastic and they felt like they could put all of their eggs in their basket of PCR. And I can't blame them. So I put here, business is business. But what happened for us was we had about a three to four week period where our equipment was kind of almost like we couldn't access our equipment. We couldn't get our stuff. And finally, um, we said to them, you know, we, we need to end this relationship. It's not working because they just decided that they only wanted to run certain things and we knew that we didn't, we needed to run our experiments. And, and so we then left. And at that point I made a decision that we needed to start really heavily working, get away from RNA and work on saliva. And that the other thing is that we had to find the right experts. And so I point you to this too. At the same time, Yale Saliva Direct's test had gotten approved and its reported limit of detection was 6,000 to 12,000 copies per mil. And so this is why I put beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because here I was trying to convince this clinical lab that our level of detection, which would be probably estimated about the same, if not better, would be competitive with Yale Saliva Direct. And one bad experiment just gave them cold feet and they didn't want to hear it. And I could tell you all of the reasons why that I would not have designed the experiment the same way, but they just did not have time. It was too pressing. They did not want to discuss it. So this was kind of funny because at the same time we come, you know, here this competitor comes along, they have an assay, reasonable level of detection. So what do we do? This is me, this is me um, reviving the, the patient that was dead on the table about 10 times over the course of this project. And so I was like, what do I do? You know, this is, uh, I don't believe in their data interpretation. I don't think either one of us is handling the data correctly. And I know I'm not an expert in this technology. And through a long convoluted path that involved LinkedIn, a press release, and tracking someone down, I actually tracked down the expert who had had this assay approved as a diagnostic for HCV and HIV many years ago. And his name was Scott Eastman, and we've been working with him ever since. And Scott was so intrigued that I was using this old technology that he had developed for this test, it, be, it formed a friendship and he's helped us ever since. And he became um, really a champion of what we were doing. So I think for students, I think the important part is you, if you know that you're maybe not handling data correctly, or if there's something not right, it's important to find someone who really knows it and understands it. And I, what I can say is I didn't really understand a clinical diagnostic assay, especially for virology and Dominion didn't either. And so really we both got lost because neither one of us, it turns out once we gave the data to Scott, we weren't handling the data properly. So there are lots of next steps. One of the next steps, this was many balls in the air, was that we were um, recruiting subjects to get paired, to get nasal swabs and saliva. And so there were a lot of challenges and this was late August where there were very few positives. We would recruit people, we'd have, be paying them as research subjects and we might only get four out of 40 positives. 
So we changed some of our recruiting tactics. We got involved with recruiting students at URI. It only took a few weeks for a lot of positives to start cropping up at the university once the students were back. And then we started embedding with contact tracing and getting more positives. And so over this time frame, um, our students were making test kits. They were um, going out and getting clinical samples. And then I was working with Dr. Eastman to design the proper experiments to go forward in saliva. So this is what our test kit looks like. It's very cheap. It's a 50 mil conical tube. It costs 10 cents. You spit into it. It's sterile. Um, this step probably won't, will now happen in the lab, but at the time, the person had to transfer a pipette and a conical tube that was preloaded with some buffer that would keep the RNA stable. And so this whole kit was costing um, really like less than a dollar per um, test kit, which was very important because there are you know, obviously better tools out there, but when you start adding on just the collection kit itself, that can be very expensive. Um, this is a student, uh, Naomi, and she created a, a video to, for our research subjects so they could get on and, and know what they were doing. This was us at our clinical site. So the university has a mobile health unit. Um, they, run, they were running the Abbott ID Now out of this mobile health unit in Pawtucket. And this, these are pictures of us going and um, recruiting our research subjects to give the saliva samples. And so we were able to do that over the course of a few weeks. And we started having success with saliva. So just here's some kind of raw data to see so you can see what we what we were looking at. So here's saliva alone. Here's the, the RLU output for 10,000 copies per mil. And then here's the output for 12,000 copies per mil. And, and these numbers in red are, are controls that we run on every plate. And I think what you can see visually right away is that there's no overlap between the 10,000 and the 12,000 compared to saliva. And I'll show you some much more detailed um, data, but this was this kind of the starts of data that, that were started to get us very interested that this could work well in saliva. And so we made a lot of progress over the, um, you know, basically September and October, we um, did a lot of saliva LOD experiments. We felt we were comfortably around 4,000 copies per mil. We got to present to Dr. Deborah Burks at the University of Rhode Island, and she mentioned us in a press, in a press conference, so we were super excited. Um, and then the university decided to, hit, to hire a panel of experts um, to vet our data and then basically give this, the university the green light to invest more money and resources into the project. And so that went fairly well until the expert panel became a bit like a thesis committee panel and that they kept on wanting more data. And for me, Angie, I felt like I was in the lab and actually getting a second thesis. And so we were running data, um, getting, doing experiments all the time to kind of give the experts more uh, data. And then in, by December, um, we made a final push. We were able to get the panel the data that they needed. And the data that they really needed was to show that, that our RLUs and limit of detection was concordant with a PCR-based saliva test. And so we partnered with the Rhode Island Department of Health that was due, they were working on a saliva test um, that was slightly modified from Yale's. They're not running it all the time, but we were able to kind of piggyback with their effort. And so this was um, some of the students whom helped on the assay. This day was December 11th. Um, we, we got the final bit of data that day that we needed to make our experts, to, for us to feel like we'd satisfied the, the experts' requests. Um, and that was great. And at this point, the LOD from all of this was about 4,000 to 8,000 copies per mil. And I really think, you know, given everything that happened this summer um, with the Black Lives Movement and, and all of, I think one thing that made me really excited was that I have students who, um, you know, have come to URI through different initiatives. Um, and for example, Naomi is a Mark U Star student. So that's a NIH program that, um, helps underserved and underrepresented students in the sciences. Um, it was just the same with Juliana. So this was just a, a really great diverse lab um, that helped. So I just wanna take you lastly through just a few minutes. I hope I, I can't tell the time. So am I doing okay on time? Yes, you're doing fine. Okay. okay. So I just wanna take you guys through the last part of the talk about the, of the data. So I crunched data, but what I found was that our expert did a much better job. And so he would he would analyze my data and we would talk about it. And I learned a lot in his analysis. So one of the first things that he did was he, we had a calibration plate for our luminometers. 
and then he had data and he looked at the two luminometers that we were using. We had an old one, we had a new one that we were demoing. Did it matter? And the, the answer was yes. So the 7% variability was basically a brand new luminometer that we were um, test driving from Promega. And that was actually one of the concerns that led to us leaving Dominion was that there can be bleed through. So if you have a very high RLU sample, a sample that's throwing off a lot of light next to a sample that has nothing in it, if that high one bleeds into the low one, now you have a situation where that low one can look like a positive even though it's not. And so I knew when we were back in Dominion that we needed to have a different luminometer. I, I could look at the data and say, you can't put a negative sample next to something high, it's going to bleed over. And so that was actually his first recommendation to us is this luminometer is old, it doesn't work, you need to get something better. And so we did and we purchased the new one. And so again, like academia, this is how we live, right? We're, we're always teetering on, you know, equipment that's kind of not working, working, um, massaging it to make it work. And so that was, I, I do think had we started out in a lab where everything was pristine and new, there are a lot fewer hiccups we would have encountered along the way. He also looked at our data for variability. So one of the things he had me do was just put 40,000 copies of, um, of uh, the virus per well and load every single well on the plate. And then just look, what does it look like across your assay? And so he did that and he did kind of an analysis and said, okay, well, you know, it's not horrible, but you need, you need to figure out a way to improve this. And so we worked on that. He looked at that once we had lower limits of detection and, and what you can see here. So this is our plate and he's kind of coded it with um, coloring depending on what the RLUs are. And so this is negative saliva. This was saliva that had 6,000 copies per mil spiked into it. And this is 8,000 copies per mil. And these graphs, sorry, at the bottom can kind of show the row of the plate versus the RLUs. And I think what you can really see visually is that when you get to the negatives or you get to the 6,000s, there's a bias. There's something going on in those first um, columns A and columns B that were causing some high numbers. And so we had to kind of go back and think about how we were running the assay, where we were placing plates and ovens, how we were pipetting to kind of avoid what was some, was, what was some sort of plate bias. But I would have never thought about that. That I mean, maybe I would have somewhat, but not really. But so him helping us with that early on kind of helped us to minimize some of the variability. And then he started doing analyses of what our data looked like um, when, when you plotted all of the data in histograms. And so here you can really nicely see that the, the negative saliva really separates out very well compared to the 6,000 and the 8,000. Now it's not surprising that the 6,000 and the 8,000 don't completely separate, but um, because there will be some variability. But, but you know what we were hoping for is that we would see a nice separation um, with negative saliva and we did. And this was you know, very highly significant. So other, something else we learned along the way is you have to large, run a large N. You have to run a lot of samples and a lot of wells, a lot of different times to kind of generate data that you feel confident about in a clinical assay. We also gave him this data for, um, so this was the same analysis, but this, but with four and 5,000 copies per mil. And again, seeing a good clear separation and a nice statistical separation between our um, negative sample and the ones that were uh, spiked. Now I will say that um, this was kind of some of the data that encouraged the university to go further. So he kind of said that he felt that we could potentially get down to a LOD of a thousand copies per mil. And so after that, what we did was we spent pretty much all of November and part of December running many, many samples. They were spiked all around our limit of detection and running them many days. And then what he did was he did a lot of analysis around whether or not they were linear and reproducible and how variable they were. And so here's the plot just showing the RLUs for the assay over different days and the amount of virus. And you know, here's an example of where Dominion and I got it wrong. Neither one of us thought to put our data in log 10. And a virologist will almost always, especially in this type of assay, put their data in log 10. And just little things like that. And there were lots of statistical approaches that he used that were different, that were well refined compared to what I knew for statistics. But here this shows a really nice linearity for the assay. 
And here he shows um, in his analysis that that it was actually, um, we can feel very confident over these multiple runs. These represent multiple days and multiple times that the assay was um, highly like statistically significant at, at more than 8,000 copies per mil. But really potentially we also, he, um, you know, with more time and data and energy um, that there, that it's actually somewhere between probably three and 5,000 copies per mil. We think 3,000, but, but that's probably as low as we'll be able to go. Um, reproducibility. So our struggle has been that the negative saliva, the less input you have, sometimes that's when assays tend to be variable. It needs, the assay needs something in order for it to kind of work and, and to be less variable. So this has been our challenge is we've, we've um, tried to work on ways to decrease the, the noisiness of our negatives. Um, but with that said, he, he basically concluded that there was still a very good spread in our data even with that variability and it supports uh, an LOD of about 3000 copies per mil. So currently, um, you know, with saliva as an input, the assay is working pretty well. And uh, generally it's reproducible with variations um, less than 15% across the dynamic range. So that's generally meeting the standard for um, this type of assay. It's dynamic, so it can span three ranges and its sensitivity is about 3000 copies per mil and conservatively 8,000 copies per mil. And if you recall, um, that's well within the competitiveness of Yale Saliva Direct that's being used currently and all the time. Um, his, recommend, his recommendation to us was that we did need to understand reproducibility more and that's really where we've been spending our energies. This was a huge debate. You have to decide, like you or I had to decide what it felt was a reasonable LOD. And that's where our expert panel got held up. Um, so we had to, I had to go to, to URI's physician and say, please do some research and tell me what viral load you feel comfortable with for a surveillance test. And so we did, we had a discussion about it and our discussion basically boiled down to if it's as sensitive as Abbott ID now, that's acceptable. Um, we still, you know, we're still in the process of, of kind of working through the clinical saliva samples, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Um, and then, you know, this was probably one of my favorite, like most uplifting sentences in my career, which was, in my estimation, this test equals or outperforms many of the EUA approved tests. So we thought that was really great. And so this was, uh, um, this is a list of the currently FDA EUA approved tests for saliva now. And as you can see, we have ones that are, you know, approved at 180,000 copies per mil. Um, and we, we hope to be somewhere in this range of, um, you know, being hopefully around 5,000 copies per mil reliably. So what's left to do? Um, the URI, URI's hired a director to finish this. Um, she has eight years of clinical experience. She worked for LabCorp. She knows her stuff and, and, and she's been able to move extremely fast. She's preparing the FDA EUA submission now, getting together all the paperwork. We've set up a clinical diagnostic laboratory with um, her aiming to have CLIA status for May, 2021. We've partnered with the um, athletics department and gotten donor money and um, are working with the NCAA to test athletes. And so the NCAA has approved our test to be used as a surveillance tool for athletes. And so over the next few months, we'll be delivering 20,000 tests and along the way collecting nasal swabs. And the Rhode, Island, the Rhode Island Department of Health is helping us by running those nasal swabs for us by the thermo -tac -pac path PCR assay. Um, we hope to get the FDA EUA submission. And obviously our goal um, in the short term is to be able to have a test that you or I can use over the next couple of years that would save money for them. Um, 5,000 tests per week adds up. At $30 a test, it's about $2 million per semester. So if we can deliver our test at what we think is a price point of more like 10, then we're saving the university um, a lot of resources and money. And so with that, um, that's where we're at. It's been quite a journey. Um, we have a, I have a lot of people to thank. My lab group worked really, really hard. Thermo Fisher provided us a tremendous amount of support. Um, URI's leadership has been really great. The Rhode Island Department of Health was um, just completely I mean, they were awesome partners. We talk to them all the time. We share resources. 
And then I have to say, if there was a champion doctor, Scott Eastman, really, he, he was one of those people who performed CPR for me and got that patient's heartbeat going again and, and really championed everything. And, and kind of because of him being able to look at what other people were doing and consult, say to my leadership team, you know, this is, this is actually really good work and you should invest in it. And so I'm really in, indebted to him because I learned a tremendous amount from him. Um, Dr. Thompson chaired the expert panel and, and he, he, I had to prove a lot to him in order to convince him that this was something worth continuing. And, and he eventually became uh, convinced. So, so I think overall, it was a really um, interesting journey, really lots of learning. I could have spent another hour on it, um, but it all circles back and it all circles back to some time in Missouri and Kansas and using a technology that, that I first used as a postdoc. So I, that's all I have for today. So thank you and, and thanks for your, for your listening. Wow. Um, you know, you and I used to have discussions about PCR versus branch DNA 20, 21 years ago, coming full circle again for me. Listen, uh, folks in the room, what I think you just saw was an amazing example of someone who is fearless, intrepid, engaged, about as smart as they come, talented, articulate, poised, resilient, motivated, collaborative, with amazing leadership. You did this with undergrads? Some, yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. Angela, you're a hero. Um, I had thoughts of going down this path, but I'm satisfied to see it vicariously. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for sharing that experience. Uh, that was amazing. I see some folks with hands up. Uh, Dr. Pence, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much. This was a great talk. I, I'm both uh, energized and a little exhausted from everything you had to go through. <laughs> uh, and just for our students here, and uh, you uh, touched on this a little bit, but the resilience and the grit that you demonstrated and multiple times throughout thinking, gosh, is what I'm doing, you know, is it going to work out or not? How Can you just touch on that a little bit more and how how did you, you pull deep? Did you have a mentor that taught you how to deal with this? You know, when your equipment's going out, like what, what how did you find your motivation and your drive in those times? And, and any, any great. recommendations you'd have for our students would be great. Okay. So, so to kind of comment to the first person question, part of the question last, um, one of the things that we look for when we screen graduate student applicants or how their progress is, is grit. I don't know how we, we've been trying to quantify someone's grit, but I say as a graduate student, you need to have, scientists have to have grit. Um, how do you get the grit? I think you have to really believe in what you're doing. Of course it has to be modeled. I mean, without a doubt, Kurt Claussen had an insane amount of grit, had high expectations. We never gave up, we always worked hard. And there was an expectation that you always, always tried to rise to the top. Um, I think at times I believed that the science would work. And I believed I, you have to look at your whole landscape. And so I would say to myself, you know, I don't understand because this test is getting approved and it's way less sensitive than our test. And what we really had to overcome was this notion of convincing people that PC, it's PCR or bust. I felt like it was like a Brady Bunch episode where it's like, Marsha, 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 it's PCR and nothing else. And we had to kind of convince people and believe in ourselves that we had a good test. And I think once Scott got involved and he had that experience, it lended some weight that I didn't have before. And I don't really know when or why but I just knew that I'd gotten so far that it would be a shame to give up. And I guess I just was persistent. Um, grit is something that you can learn, but I think you find it in passion in what you do. And I, and I felt, again, I believed in the science. I knew the theory behind the science would work. And I knew if I could get saliva samples into that test, that in every other time I had run this test, like I said, I had 45 papers on this. I knew that it would work. Would it, and I knew, we, we predicted at the beginning of the exercise that it would be somewhere between 100 and 200 copies would be the sensitivity. 
And that's where we are. And it was because we understood the science behind it. Um, I think you can't let negative voices get you down. So there was one person in particular who would just be, he was just so willing to just give up, willing to give up. And at one point I realized, I, I went back to the university and I said, if we don't get the FDA EUA, it doesn't matter. There, there's new guidance that's come out that we could use this for surveillance. Why don't you guys use this for surveillance? Why do you even have to go this route? Have you looked into that? And that shaped the conversation a lot. So I think I had to do a lot of thinking and clawing and digging along to convince people that we had something worth doing and that um, just to put a little bit more energy into it. It's hard. I think you have to have a lot of confidence and self-belief and that just comes with time, wisdom and probably some arrogance that isn't always earned. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Dr. Schneira, go ahead. Dr. Slit, thank you so much for a great presentation. I take my hat off just to acknowledge how much you achieved during this um, one and a half years. Uh, forgive me, because there are about hundreds of my students now attending your presentation. So forgive me that I will uh, speak now obvious things before I ask my question. Uh, any essay may produce false negative or false positive results, whatever cause, bleeding, contamination, etc. cetera. Uh, did you estimate for your essay negative, positive, predictive value and specificity? Yes. Yeah. So, so this assay doesn't, so first of all, when it, with regard to contamination and trace contamination, it's um, less likely in this assay because it doesn't have that same type of level of uh, sensitivity that a PCR assay would have. So because of its it not being amplified, it's, it doesn't, it's not the same type of amplification, that's less of a concern. Um, as far as specificity, yes. I didn't show that data, but we did, we were able to do it in silico, and we also did it through acquiring various viral RNAs from other SARS viruses, as well as influenzas, and tested those um, in the assay. So we did, absolutely. That's one of the things you have to do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wolf, go ahead. You're muted, Dennis. Sorry about that. Two mute buttons. I enjoyed your talk very much like the others did. Uh, I was curious, you mentioned you had a lot of noise in your uh, negative samples. And I was curious if there was something causing that, like related to particulate matter in the saliva from foods they'd eaten or bacteria or things like that, and, and how you um, might, or how you currently process and whether or not you looked at the pro possibility of changing your buffer or your extraction procedure a little bit? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. The, the variability seemed inherent, whether it was saliva or just water. So um, really where we're at is we're working with uh, the expert quite a bit because it's probably temperature. And so we've, we've tried some modifications to make the, the temperature more even across the assay plate to try to, to eliminate that. So that was one thing. Um, the second was, I think you're right and that there probably was some particulate matter. And recalling, if you have any particulate matter that's biological, um, because this is a substrate-based assay, the you know, final step, there's a theory you could maybe, you know, there could be some residual elk phosphorus around. And so we did increase the number of washes and that did help us with um, decreasing the variability a little bit. And the other thing that, that helped us was that in our very first step, we added a mixing step that we hadn't done before. And so there were some minor things, but this didn't seem to be necessarily a saliva problem. It was just a problem that in this particular assay, there seems to be when there's, a, when there's no input, there's nothing for, the, for it to grab onto and there's something to do with the temperature. The other thing we did very recently, we, we bumped it up a single degree for hybridization temperatures and that actually helped quite a bit. So just one degree. <laughs> That's why they call it research. <laughs> exactly. Dr. Ogbas, go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Slit to share your uh, uh, journey. It was really interesting. 
I have a question, regulatory question. <laughs> I'm uh, working in the IBC Institution of Biosafety Committee. So what was the, your uh, biosafety level of your uh, laboratory to carry on this uh, infectivity, uh, I mean, inf infectious, uh, the virus? Yeah. Was it BSL-3 or 4 or 2 or? <laughs> so, so BSL-2. So, so we, we um, before anything came into the laboratory, aside from working with like our, our IBC chair, who's a virologist, um, we also worked with Rhode Island Department of Health. And I have to say it was very challenging because at the time, you know, guidance was kind of emerging, but, but here's why we felt that we were, B, why it was kind of deemed that we were BSL-2 or maybe BSL-2 plus was because we were handling extracted nucleic acids from samples. And so realistically for those nucleic acids to be infective, again, they would have had to be like kind of reintroduced into a cell, which as anybody knows who does transfections, um, even, especially with RNA, um, you know, that's really challenging to do. And so I think for that reason, um, we, were, we were BSL-2. Some people would argue BSL-2 plus, we kind of handled ourselves like BL2, BSL-2 plus. As time moved on, we were able to get um, standards that were less infectious. So they were BSL-1. And then with our clinical samples, what happened actually was that we would have the research subject put their saliva in a lysis buffer that has lithium lauryl sulfate in it. And it, lithium lauryl sulfate is a pretty strong detergent. And so that would now be, make that, that infectious sample down to at least BSL-2, probably more likely BSL-1. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Students? Um, others? All right, so we're at the bottom of the hour and there's another session. Session. Uh, bye, Kurt. Good to see uh, you again. Let me ask a question. Okay, go ahead. Can you, uh, first of all, that was very impressive. I can't believe you got so much work done in one year but you know this is just 12 months that's unbelievable uh and all of the uh, troubles that you ran into i remember when we started this technique in the lab actually uh, dylan hartley uh, was the person that i originally put on this project as it seemed like a, a tremendous technique and uh and I remember even at that time, uh, you know, there were days when things wouldn't work. And so we would get everybody from the lab into a, into a joint meeting to try to figure out uh, why it wasn't working and doing all of the troubleshooting. And uh, troubleshooting is a very important talent to learn. and. Uh, it appears that uh, you learned it extremely well, and uh, that is fantastic. The, the real question that I have is, I read in the newspaper that the United States has purchased 10 million or whatever magic number it is of, of tests that people can run at home and that they've purchase this technique from uh, Australia or someplace. Uh, do you know what that technique is based on? Um, well, I know the, the, the Abbott Binax, which is the, the one that's currently, I know, for example, Rhode Island got 300,000 of them. That's an antigen test. So for example, my boys take that one when they're getting tested before sports that's the one I can immediately think of from Abbott. And that's 40,000 copies per mil, and that's an antigen test. So the antigen tests are typically less sensitive than the nucleic acid-based tests. Sure. Advantages and disadvantages. I think, again, advantages and disadvantages. Um, 4,000 versus 40,000 is, is you know one order of magnitude different. 40,000 copies per mil. So um, one of their teammates was positive. Showed up that day. So the good thing is right away, you know, okay, that's a highly infectious individual. That individual needs to quarantine from everybody. There is no doubt 
So I think that that's the benefit of them. Um, I think the disadvantage is sometimes they, you know, had that test been administered five days before that, it could have totally missed it. Very good. Yeah. I think there's a place for everything. I think the other thing to consider is school children. School children don't really want to get nasal swabs. So I think, you know, uh, at least our thinking with RIDO is that if we could create a scenario where the school kids were getting tested, especially because the, the virus is very stable in saliva, um, especially refrigerated, it can stay for a, a while, like 14 days. Not that we'd want to wait that long, but just that it's very, it's actually very stable in saliva. Uh, just as a, a, a different type of comment, I think it's very clever how somebody figured out that the university, the word university has a U and R and an I in it. And uh, you can highlight those three letters. I guess not too many universities can do that. Unless you have like a University of Iowa or something. <laughs> uh, anyhow, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, you made me proud. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you make us proud, Kurt. Mm -hmm. Dr. Schneira. Uh, Dr. Slida, I would like to have your opinion on one information recently appeared. It's about um, COVID vaccine, which as we know, mRNA vaccine. So they claiming now that it is stable uh, uh, under normal uh, for scientific degree. How they stabilize it? it? Do you have any idea? I don't know. And what I, what I don't know too, oh, maybe Jeff, Jeff, do you know the answer to this? Maybe um, some of those vaccines that are coming out are DNA based rather than RNA based. And they're um, uh, so double stranded DNA is inherently way more stable than RNA. Now, if they're RNA uh, vaccines, yeah, I don't know. And I wanted to ask, are you using RNA later in, in your saliva sample samples? Is it? No. No. So, so it will be oh. what? RNA, RNA later will be prohibited uh, to put into samples. Yeah, I, we, we did try some RNA inhibitors for ours, but it doesn't really, it doesn't matter. The, 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 um, it's stable in saliva in of itself, but on top of that, it's very stable in, the, in that first buffer step. Okay. So that first buffer has proteinase K ah. and it has, um, detergent okay so you know so it's different like pcr can't handle that but this assay can so for that reason that's why we can immediately get it into something that it, it really preserves the rna and in fact i could have standards i mean you know not purposely but you can have standards that sat out for hours at a time at 55 degrees and nothing would change because oh. it was just inherently very stable within that um coming back to the question the pfizer vaccine is rna based but my suspicion is, is maybe that it takes, you know, every time you change a step in the regulatory environment, you have to validate it. And so Pfizer might have just decided to go with the most conservative route because it would have slowed them down to retest everything. So my suspicion, I could be totally wrong, but it could be something like that. And now that they've had time, they went back and revalidated the, the, the storage conditions. So nothing has changed, just... They tested, had time to test stability. Yeah. A reasonable explanation. That sounds Thank likely. You. That sounds likely. Do Dr. Agbas, go ahead. Uh, uh, Dr. Slit, one more question. You mentioned about your uh, interest, say, uh, um, uh, the uh, CVs, the less than 15 person. I'm just curious about the intra essay CV. What was your intra essay CV? means that in the given same day, you repeat the, I'm giving the example, 10 times, what, what was your CV? Probably about the same, but I have to say, I'm not, I'm sure we have that analysis from the, from the, from Dr. Eastman, but I, I can't, I, I can't give you an exact number. I'm sure that's been done in some way, but just ballpark figure in my head, it, was not too bad, like probably between 10 and 15%, probably pretty much the same. And I can tell you, this is what I can tell you is that we would look for, we always have the certain standards that are always run the same, like they're the same. I, there's hundreds of them allocated. And within those, it, it, I don't even know if it was 
it was pretty low. Like almost, I'd get almost the same, not the same exact number, but it would be in the 7,000s every single time. So I would say probably less than 10%. Thank you. Any more questions for our speaker? If not, we're going to uh, take a short break and then come back to this room and have a discussion with uh, two-year uh, research track students to provide inspiration. Thank you for this talk, part one, and we'll see you in about five minutes, okay? Okay, so we can just kind of turn our screens off and take a break? Yes. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks, everybody.